over the last six months, I've been working on a, a model of what the universe could look like from a geocentric point of view. Um, obviously, we've got the mainstream point of view, which is obviously very um, wrong in many ways um, and possibly right in other ways as well, which I'm going to try and prove today. Um, but the ancients quite obviously knew a lot more than, than we know today about, um, about these truths. So I used a method that I learned off Santos, uh, the method of um, syncretism. Um, to try and connect the dots and come up with a cohesive, um, geocentric universe that makes sense at least. Of course, we'll never know the truth, the whole truth, naturally, in this state of consciousness. Um, but I think we can certainly get as close to it as possible through syncretism um, and, and other means as well. Um, so that's what I've done. I've syncretized um, mainly four avenues. I've syncretized Vedic. Um, scriptures, um, Kemetic Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology, Norse mythology, a bit of the Bible, and a bit of the science we're taught today, mainstream science. There's a, a lot of truth in there. Um, we just have to be able to, to decipher what they're telling us, but they are telling us quite a few truths, which I think um, might be a bit controversial in the um, flat earth community. But uh, I'm sure my argument is going to be quite compelling, hopefully. Right, I'm going to start. I'm going to start from the beginning. Um, my presentation is based on the cosmic egg theory, the theory that our universe is inside um, an egg or a shell, um, which is actually a torus field. Okay, everything is, is, is toroidal. Um, so... I'm going to start from the beginning. Right. So in the beginning, all cultures and even mainstream science tells us that there was nothing, absolutely nothing, the void, emptiness, empty space. Um, today, science calls it infinite space, time, and matter. Okay. Um, past cultures also had names for this. Um, the Greeks called it the chaos. Um, the Norse um, called it the gunning gap. Um, the Egyptians called it the noon. Um, this is the void. This is everything and nothingness. This is the, the multiverse. Okay. Um, I think there's no way to express it or to explain it in any words um, or level of consciousness that we have now. So we're going to try and use words that we can relate to at best. This space is intelligent, conscious, it is beautiful, it is divine, it is holy. So if I use certain words, um, they're not going to do this justice, um, whatever this is, this infinite space, time and matter. This is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. Okay? So that was everything and nothingness, the void of infinite potential to begin with. At some point, this void decided to separate a part of itself to create and experience life outside itself, because it can. Um, this is the nature of infinite potential, um, to use that potential. And the first creation, from our point of view, was what we know as the Holy Trinity, okay? Which I've drawn there, as the, uh, you can see the Vesica Pisces there, you can see the flower of life. This is the first form of creation in our universe. Mainstream science today calls this the point of singularity or the great attractor. It's the same thing. Religion would call it uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, protons, neutrons, electrons, um, Zeus, um, Poseidon, and, uh, and uh, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Um, many cultures called it different things. You, you'll find that the gods or the creators in all cultures always are in threes. They're always in threes. So three is the magic number of creation, okay? So these are the building blocks of life. I prefer to call it um, electromagnetic pulses of sine wave or frequency, which is basically a star. This is the first star. This is God, the creator. We are all stars. Everything is a tomb, as, um, as Santos always says. Everything's a star. It's, it's all 
it's all the same thing. We are stars. The sun that we look up at, you know, in the sky is a star. The stars in the firmament are stars. God is a star. Creation is a star. Right? At different frequencies, at different levels of consciousness, etc., etc. So uh, we've got the Holy Trinity now. We've got the building blocks of life. The first order of business was to create a home or a hub or a shell where it would experience life separate from the whole. So obviously, remember, this Holy Trinity is still in the void. It's still in the, in the infinite potential. But it needs to have its own world in order to create um, and, and experience life. And by the way, that, that Holy Trinity basically is where the meaning of life is. Before I move on, really important. Okay, in Vedic cosmology, you've got um, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, creator, sustainer, and the destroyer. And that is life. That is the cycle of life, birth, experience, and death. That, those, that, that is the, the blueprint of, of, of existence as we know it. Those are the three things we all know for certain. There is no debate. Everyone is born, everything is created, Everything lives and everything has to die and will die at some stage. So that's the first rule of creation. Okay. And that is what this Holy Trinity is. And that's where it began. Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Now, it is also worth mentioning that death is never permanent. Okay. Death is never permanent. If we're all stars, like I've said, um, stars never die. Stars are energy. Energy goes and lives forever. So what we truly, truly are lives forever. However, the experiences that we have in their different forms have to die at some stage, which is what reincarnation is. So you are born in this body, in this life, in this age, at this time. You live and you experience um, whatever you're experiencing at that time, but that must die. That experience must die for you to experience something new, which is what reincarnation is, which is the point of life. Because you have to learn from that, you grow from that, you move on. So that's the meaning of life. The meaning of life is um, creation, experience, um, growth, and moving on. And then it repeats itself. And you see that with, with everything, with a tree. A tree um, grows, it lives, it bears fruit or whatever, um, it dies, and then the next season it grows fruit again, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Energy never ever dies. So death, permanent death, does not exist and never will because everything is energy and energy is infinite. Like I've said, all this came from infinite space, time and matter. Infinite, meaning forever. So there's no such thing as permanent death. Death is temporal. It's temporary. Okay, moving on. So they needed to create a world where they could express these three things. The cycle of birth, experience, and death. Because those things don't exist in the void, in the car, obviously. Because that's infinite potential. So the first thing they built was this, a tourist field, right? A shell. To shell themselves from the void, from the car. They're now independent. They're now separate. They're now experiencing life outside the hole. Okay? Now, in that void, by the way, in the car... There are many, many other universes and many, many other expressions of experience that are different to us. So this is not unique. We're not the only shell or egg in the universe or in the multiverse. There are many, many of these, right? But this is ours. This is where we are, okay? So they created this egg, as many cultures called it. Um, the Vedics called it the Brahmanda. Uh, the... Norse mythology, they called it Ymir, the god Ymir, because expressed through the god Ymir. Um, in Greek mythology, it's the Ophian egg. Um, in uh, Kemetic e Egyptian uh, mythology, they called it the, um, the Apep, the serpent Apep. And it's always depicted as a snake or a serpent, which is energy. If you see a snake in ancient mythology, it's always expressing energy. Okay? So this is the torus field, electromagnetic torus field that was built. And inside, you've now got primordial waters. It's empty. This is when the Big Bang happened. So when mainstream science says the Big Bang happened at the point of singularity, there's some truth in that. What they're not telling us is that that singularity 
and that process is a conscious, intelligent creation. It is not a random um, uh, process. It's not something that happened randomly. It was intelligently designed. Again, that star is far more intelligent than we are. If we are a star, we are probably at 5% intelligence. This intelligence is at 100, okay? Just to put it into context, that's obviously not accurate, but anyway. So now we've got a womb, right? This is the womb of creation. This is now the universe, our universe, okay? Move on to slide number four. The next bit was for these three entities to um, choose their domains, basically, in this universe. At the top, you've got Brahma, who's the creator. In the middle, you've got Vishnu, the sustainer, which is life. At the bottom, you've got Shiva, which is destruction, the destroyer. So now, the one is now divided into three, okay? Um, at the top, this is where the, that 33.333% comes in, the number 33. This is why it's so big in, in a lot of these cultures, number 33, because the universe is divided into that, into three aspects. 33.333333 makes the whole, okay? So now we've got at the top, positive polarity, okay? The beginning, creation. In the middle, we've got life, sustenance, and experience. This is where the circle of life happens. And at the bottom, we've got the end, death, destruction, negative polarity, right? These two are gravity, okay? So when mainstream science says that gravity exists, it kind of does, but it's a transcendental gravity. It's not a physical gravity, it's transcendental, okay? You've got blue shift and red shift. If you've watched Santos's videos, he talks about that quite a lot, red shift and blue shift. This is where it begins. This is the original blue shift and red shift. Blue shift at the top, Red shift at the bottom, okay? The next order of business was to create a cosmic highway, okay? Because at the moment, everything within this is closed off from the whole, from the multiverse, from all the other universes and all the other experiences outside this egg, okay? So a cosmic highway was created in the middle of this, um, of this egg. To make it easier, if that's an egg, right, that is the cosmic highway going down through the center, okay, connecting the outside multiverse, the void, the, you know, other universe with us inside here. We are now inside. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are inside this universe, right, creating, experiencing, and destroying whatever they, they feel like creating, sustaining, and destroying, right, okay. So that, that is what this is. This is a cross section, okay? So now we've got a cosmic vortex. This is what science calls the axis. Yep, the cosmic axis, okay? Many cultures um, called it many things. In Greek mythology, it was personified as the Greek god Aelus, the keeper of the winds. Um, in Vedic mythology, it's known as uh, the Merudanda, okay? In Kemetic Egypt, it's Horus. I think it was a falcon also keeper of the winds or something to do with the winds. Um, in Norse mythology, they talk about the Bifrost Bridge. Same thing. This is the spine. This is a black hole, if you like. Sometimes science says the black hole in the universe. This is the black hole. Um, this is the father and keeper of winds, energy, flow of weather, currents, everything starts from here. Starts from this energy in the middle. This is the engine room right, powering everything inside this cosmic egg, right? So now we've got that. So the next bit was to now put form to the universe, okay? So now we've established, we've got at the top, we've got blue shift, blue fire, okay? At the bottom, we've got red fire, red shift. These are both polarity, magnetism. Okay, different forms of magnetism, you know, um, uh, different modalities of magnetism, okay? In the middle, we now have the ether, okay? We've got air. At the bottom, we've got the water. In the Bible, they say God said, um, God separated the waters above from the waters below. So the waters above are the atmospheres. The waters below 
are the actual waters below. Okay, in the middle is where Earth comes in. Okay, this is where Earth. The Kemetic Egyptians said in the middle, in the beginning, God created um, the Ben Ben, and Ben Ben translates to mound or pyramid. Okay, so a mound or a pyramid was created. This is Gaia in Greek mythology. It's Geb, Mother Geb in Kemetic um, Egypt. Um, same thing, right? So this tells me that this must be a pyramid of some sort, the earth originally, and probably still is today. Now you see those elements that we always talk about. Earth, wind or air or ether, water and fire, building blocks of life. Right, these are the first physical building blocks of life in our universe. Right, earth where we are, the air above us, atmosphere, the waters below us, and the fire would be the heavens and the hells, top and bottom. Right, this is the Buloka in Vedic cosmology. Right, I'll try and um, okay, let's go into detail. Right, this Buloka, right, the Egyptians said it was the Ben Ben, a pyramid. And I think it looks something like this, okay? As above, so below. So it's a pyramid at the top and a pyramid at the bottom, okay? Right? I think at the center here, at some stage, there was a capstone, right? Which I'll explain in a, in a minute. At the moment, it's a crater, but I'll explain that in detail in a moment. Now, mainstream science tells us that our Earth has got three layers, three inner layers. There's a crust, a mantle, an inner core, and an outer core, right? But they tell us that this is on a spinning ball. I'm saying that it is not. What they're actually trying to tell us is that these are the four layers in the Ben Ben. This is the cross section, by the way, okay? And I'll show you what, what it is a cross section of. The crust, the mantle, the inner core, and the outer core inside the earth, which is basically, This, this is the Ben Ben, this is the earth, but this is the top half. So if you imagine this at the top, there's also a bottom bit, an upside down pyramid, okay? And that is sitting on the great deep, on the waters below. And above, you've got the waters above, which are the atmospheres, right? So when they tell us that the earth has got three layers, a crust, a mantle, an inner core, and an outer core, that is inner earth inside this Ben Ben, the layer between the two pyramids. So there's some truth in that, okay? So I found that really, really um, interesting when I came across that, okay? The ancient cultures also talk about these, um, this Ben Ben in quite a lot of detail, okay? The um, Egyptians called it Geb, Mother Geb, the Indo-Vedics, the Buloka, which is the land. Um, in, in Greek, it was Mother Gaia. And in Norse mythology, it was Midgard. Okay. The top, the top of this also had names. Okay. So the whole thing has got a name. In Kemetic Egypt, it's the Ben Ben, right? But on the top, this is Mother Geb. If you're looking from the top, this was Mother Geb. Okay? In Greek mythology, the whole thing is Gaia. But the top, as you see with these concentric rings, is Atlantis or Atlas. Okay? In um, Norse mythology, they just call it all Midgard. Okay? They had one name for it. In Vedic cosmology or in Vedic scripts, they call the whole thing the Bur Loka, but the top is the Bu Mandala, the concentric rings of the Bu Mandala. Okay, it's also interesting that in Greek mythology, they said that Mother Gaia had two children. Okay, this is Mother Gaia, the whole thing, had two children. Who are the two children? 
The two children are the top part and the bottom part, Prometheus and Epimetheus. These are the two held be below us. Okay? Right. I hope that makes sense. So I'll move on to the next slide. Right. Now that we established that this is what the whole earth looks like, our entire earth is a pyramid humandala with four concentric rings. Right? One, two, three, four. Everything is in fours in the universe, right? All creation is in force in the universe, right? At the center, we've got what we now know as the Garden of Eden. So anyone who's been following our videos will know about this. The Garden of Eden's at the center. This is where we are here, the second ring. There's an outer ring and an outer ring outside that, all separated by these mountains, what we call the Antarctica ice wall. Okay, this is our South Pole, the Antarctica. And the North Pole, there is a mountain range separating us from the worlds at the center, from Eden, from Shambhala, Hyperborea. Okay, and outside they've got their own wall separating from this. This last one has got the greatest one. It's called the Loka Loka Mountains in Vedic scriptures. These are the Loka Loka Mountains, the great, great mountains. Right? And these are the last mountains before the Taurus field, the cosmic egg. Okay? So beyond this, there is no land. It's the cosmic egg locking us out from the void outside. Right? So let's focus on the center, on where we are, and what that might look like. Okay? There's some really important bits. Okay, around, okay, around each of these four worlds is also a Taurus field. So remember, this is in the Taurus field. Each of these worlds also has its own Taurus field cocooning it. So there's a Taurus field around this outer world, there's a Taurus field around this one, there's a Taurus field around that one, and there's a Taurus field at the center, okay? And what that would look like, essentially, is something like this, okay? From our perspective, from where we are, right? Almost like those Russian dolls, right? So there's one at the center, a Taurus field like that. There's one on the outside, on the outer worlds, a bigger one. And then there's a bigger one on the outside. Right now, I noticed something very interesting about this. These toroidal fields, right, are probably oblate spheroids in shape. So, when mainstream science or NASA says the Earth is an oblate spheroid, this is what they're telling us they're kind of telling us a half truth, right? Which is why they can blatantly lie with a straight face because they know they're usurping the truth. And when it comes out, they'll just probably say, well, you're too stupid to understand what we're saying, but we're telling you the truth. So this is an ablaze spheroid. Underneath where we are, this is where the four layers would be, the crust, the mantle, inner core, and outer core, just like mainstream science says, right? Inner earth. And above us, we've got the three atmospheres within our toroidal field. We've got the troposphere, the stratosphere, right? the mesosphere and the thermosphere inside our Taurus field. This top bit is what um, mainstream science calls the Van Allen belt. This is the Van Allen belt, this toroidal field, right? They tell us there's a field of energy that they cannot go past called the Van Allen belt. This is it. By the way, they also tell us that there are five Van Allen belts in the universe. So that's the four of the worlds, the fifth one being the outermost one. They also tell us that our universe is um, covered with um, cosmic background microwave radiation, which is basically a torus field. So they're telling us that the whole universe is inside a torus field. Cosmic background radiation, electromagnetism. So again, they're telling us the truths, but in a twisted way so that we don't figure out exactly what it is. 
Okay? So that is what it would look like from our perspective. Right. I also hypothesize that these toroidal fields have got different motions that they're moving at. Okay? So science tells us that the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour on its axis. Yeah? And then it's spinning at 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. And then it's spinning at 490,000 miles an hour in the universe. Again, there is some truth in that. So it's not a complete lie. So the terra firma we're standing on is obviously not spinning, but the toroidal fields around us are spinning. Okay? So I've depicted it here on this cross section. Okay? So here, we've got the pyramid Bumandala. We've got the toroidal fields going around each of the lands, over and underneath, right? One at the center, two where we are, three on the outside world, and the fourth one on the furthest out world, okay? Our toroidal field is probably moving at a thousand miles an hour, that vortex. And this toroidal field, which is being powered, well, all of them are being powered, by that cosmic vortex that we talked about in the beginning. This is the engine room that's powering the energy of all these toroidal fields, right? Because that runs straight through the middle, okay? So that's moving at a thousand miles an hour on its axis, which is that axis, just like mainstream science tells us. The next toroidal field is moving at 67,000 miles an hour around our sun, which I'll explain why in a minute. And the outer one is moving in our universe at 490,000 miles an hour, the last one. So if these figures are true, and my syncretism is true, or it, it's close, then this is what I think that means. Okay? Right. The next bit is I want to focus on... Where I put it? Our Taurus field and our Earth, where we are. Okay, so that's a cross section of it, the one that I was showing you earlier on. So that is where we would be, the terra firma, the Earth, where we're standing here. This would be the lands at the center, Eden, with its Taurus field, which mainstream science tells us quite clearly it's an electromagnetic field. At the center, at the North Pole, there's an electromagnetic field, which is a torus field, powered by the sun, so they say. So they're telling us there's a torus field at the center, okay? And this is the Van Allen belt that they tell us about, right? And then we've got the four atmospheres, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, like I said earlier on. Underneath us is Earth, right? This is the ground, the crust, the mantle, inner core, outer core and the waters and everything else sit above on the terra firma, okay? Right, each of these lands with the four different toroidal fields has got a sun and a moon. All of the lands have a sun and a moon, okay? So, if we were to look at it like that, Right? If that was the top of our toroidal field, from the top, this is where we live. Okay? Our torus field, our sun and moon, is the sun and moon that we see every day, that revolves around our torus field. These outer lands have got their own sun and moon, which are Mars and Venus. Okay? This outer land, they've got their own sun and moon as well, which is Saturn and Jupiter, the planet Saturn and Jupiter. The center is the only one that's an exception because the sun and moon there are androgynous and that's the planet Mercury. So Mercury is both a sun and a moon, okay, at the center. So now we've got the seven wandering planets. Mercury at the center, inside the sun, like mainstream science tells us, right? You've got the moon, the sun, on the outside, Venus, Mars, um, Jupiter, and Saturn being the last one. So, 
Saturn, Mars, and Apollo are suns, right? On the other side, you've got our moon, Venus, and Jupiter, which are moons, okay? And they've got their uh, respective duties or things that they do, which I'll explain a little bit later, okay? So I'll try and put this together so you can kind of see what it looks like inside the egg, okay? So now we have we have the universe, okay? I don't know if you can see it properly. Hopefully you can. Let's put it down a little bit so you can see that. And here it is, okay? That's the top of the Bumandala. And this is the top half of all the Taurus fields. Of course, they run through the bottom as well, with the different suns and moons revolving around these Taurus fields in each of the lands. So, when NASA says they're going to Mars and they plan to go to Mars, they are telling the truth. Mars are these outside lands, the outer lands, where Mars is the sun, right? That, that is where Mars is. So they are planning to go to these outside worlds at some point. They're saying at the moment they can't get past the Van Allen belt, but at some stage, they will be able to. And again, I'll explain why. Okay? So this is where Mars is. So outer space does exist. So all flat earthers out there saying that outer space doesn't exist. It does. But it's just been usurped. It's not physically going to Mars itself, the sun Mars, the, the luminary. That, that's ridiculous. It's going to these lands where Mars is the sun. That's what they're trying to tell us. Okay? So I'm going to try and stay on track here. Sometimes I get a bit. So that's what the cross section would look like. Okay. You would have the Bumandala over there. Different toroidal fields. Mercury, androgynous at the center. Sun and moon in ours. Mars and Venus in the outer one. Saturn and Jupiter on the outside. Moons and the suns. Sun and moon at the center. Okay, I think that the suns, Saturn, Mars, and our sun, they revolve. Show you. Okay, they spiral around these Taurus fields. Okay, upwards and spiral outwards and down. That's what the sun does. I think the moon follows a linear orbit. I don't think it spirals, I think it just follows one, one orbit. Or if it does spiral, it's a much slower, you know, slower orbit up and down. And I'll explain why again um, a bit later. But I think for sure, the sun and moon, this is what creates our, our, our times, our, our, our seasons. When the sun is up here at the center, this is when the, southern, the northern hemisphere have their summers because the sun is directly above them, above the North Star, above Polaris at the center. When it's out here, spiraling at the edges, this is when the people of the Southern Hemisphere have their summers, 